So welcome you all uh, for online dentists. Yet another free webinar on today's uh, and today we have we are delighted and proud and privileged uh, to introduce you the speaker of the day, George Porsa. He don't need any introduction, but it's it's my duty to introduce sir uh, uh, on this day. Uh, so from my part, from online dentistry, let me give you a warm. Happy Independence Day in India. Thank you so much for coming in large numbers for today. <clears throat> George Bort, sir, has finished. Uh, he's an oral maxillofacial uh, surgeon. He's a pioneer in that. He's an honorary adjunct professor, professor for uh, MGR University, member, member and faculty of dentistry, uh, Kerala University of Health Science. Now, that, that, that's a part about uh, typical uh, George, sir. There are lots of uh, things to talk about it. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the humanity, let me talk about the incidents that has happened to one of my friends uh, who had a trouble uh, on the way in Salem. And let me tell you, uh, he had a big trouble and uh, he don't know where to get help. He was in a deep trouble and very close friend of mine. And he wants a help and he called one of his close friends and he said, where are you? I am in Salem. He said, do not worry. I will give you one number. Just contact him. He will take care about you. You know, and the things are done. Even without the presence, the things were done. And that number was Dr. George Paul Sir. That is the human humanity or the human nature of Sir. So uh, that's the greatness of sir. Let me tell you, I don't like the conventional introduction of uh, telling degrees and all that comes. But sir is a human being and his love for human beings is something that uh, the whole world knows whom, who are associated with sir will be knowing it because he's a mentor, he's a guide. He really supports each and everyone how to go ahead. If you want to start a clinic, ask sir how to do it, how to go ahead about it. If you are already having a clinic, it is not successful, please call him and ask him, he will guide you where to start, how to start, uh, what difficulties you have. That person is uh, George Walsh. So he was a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery in Madras University, MGR and uh, Rajiv Gandhi University and Vinayaka Mission University. So he has traveled all over the South. And he is a PG and UG examiner in many universities, guided many postgraduates. Many postgraduates hand work in oral surgery is because of his skill that they, are, they, they have learned from him. He has got many 25 peer reviewed national international publications. He's a faculty speaker for numerous uh, national and international conferences and workshops. Uh, people love to hear from him. He has uh, authored and contributed two textbooks. And he is a honorary secretary uh, from 2003 to 2007 and a president in 2009 in uh, <clears throat> All Indian as Oral and Maxillofacial Association of India. Now, uh, he has many articles are there. In ResearchGate, he has published a beautiful article on intraoral minus salivary gland tumor, a retroprospective study uh, at a dental clinic. Yes, and Gorlin Gold Syndrome, a case report which is published in Europe, uh, PubMed. You know, you know, so many articles, if I want to talk about uh, articles or academic aspect about him, so much is there. That's an academic perspective about him. Now, come to the practical practice patient, a, a dental practitioner, his father, G. Paulus, as uh, Dr. G. Paulus has started the clinic in 1957. He's passed out from Nair Dental College, the prestigious Nair Dental College. He has passed out and started the clinic in 1957, you not know, 10 years after independence, he has started the clinic. You know, that time there was no Salem or there anything that is a combined province it was. And he started, he was the first dentist there. So, so such an amazing personality his father is. And he is uh, continuing his <laughs> legend. And now he, he has got two clinics and one clinic is around 3,000 square feet with seven dental chair, highly equipped, highly professional, and as the set of art you can say about it. So uh, that's about his clinical uh, aspect and the, the exposure that is giving uh, to the uh, society. And no, no introduction for the great speaker uh, uh, should end with the better half of him is Dr. 
uh, mini george his wife who is associated you can have a contact with her she is also supporting and she is the main person who's coordinating the clinic and she is a former president of salem dharmavari branch of indian dental association with this let me welcome dr george porsa thank you so much sir for uh, coming and enlightening us thank you so much sir the stage is for you sir <coughs> Can I start? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So, without much ado, I think uh, uh, I, I must uh, humbly say that uh, my introduction has made me very, very nervous because uh, I think some of the things were exaggerated a bit. <laughs> I haven't done anything uh, as magnificent as they made it out to be. But thank you very much, uh, Jobby and Binu, uh, for having organized this platform, having conducted 200 webinars, and for having invited me, I'm honored to be invited to be uh, on this platform to talk about, as Binu said, something as trivial as extractions. It is not trivial. And uh, in the course of my presentation, I'm going to tell you why it's not so trivial and why we need to give it the importance that it's due to it. Uh, I take this opportunity to wish everybody a good evening and a happy Independence Day and for all the good things that have come with independence. My slide is not moving. Uh, sir, could you, could, could you scroll through the uh, main screen, sir? There will be a, uh, just, just touch on the uh, screen, sir. Okay. Okay, right, thank you. So, to begin with, extraction is an extremely underrated dental procedure these days. The reasons are several. Within the surgical spectrum, and I've been a surgeon for about 35 years, within the surgical spectrum, uh, we find that uh, extraction is way down the ladder. Uh, however, I can tell you that having, you know, work through the whole range of uh, maxillofacial surgery that I still find extractions a very, very challenging uh, aspect of not only maxillofacial surgery, but also of dentistry. Uh, another reason is that we have uh, more and more concentrated on preserving teeth. And uh, the number of extract extractions are not the mainstay of clinical practices anymore. And another reason is that uh, extractions are, they don't, the dividends from extractions, financial dividends are not significant. So for all these reasons for, you know, extraction has been trivialized. Even the public trivializes extraction. I'll knock your teeth off and things like that. So in that background, I'd like to tell you that extraction is a surgery. It is a surgery like a cholecystectomy or an appendectomy. So we need to give it due regard. And uh, dental surgeons are extremely unique uh, in providing the service because they are both the anesthetists as well as the surgeons. And it is one of the few things that no other specialty in the health sciences can actually do. So you are in a very unique position to do it. So give it its due importance. And if you are convinced that extraction is a surgical procedure, your patients will be convinced that it is a surgical procedure, the public will give it its due, and maybe you can actually charge like you would any other surgical procedure. Uh, not that I would place too much of emphasis on the financial part of it, but uh, you need to give it its due regard. So, you know, I was talking to my friend uh, Prabhu in Madurai yesterday. It just tells you I'm 61 years old and you can learn a lot of things uh, pretty late in uh, life. And he was telling me extraction actually came from exterior traction. Apparently, uh, we used to use a textbook called Archer when I was a student. And Archer has described the word extraction as coming from exterior traction, that is tooth pulling, you know. So today, it has moved from being just an exterior traction, which, is, which refers to the buckle movement that you give to the tooth when you extract it. It has become a much more refined form of surgery 
within the armamentarium of uh, dentistry. Uh, th there is a whole sequence to any surgery, and uh, these are the things that you would normally go, you need to diagnose, take a history, investigate the patient, get an informed consent, and things like that. We don't have the time for that. So today I'm going to just concentrate on anesthesia, the procedure, and some complications. And I hope to finish in 40 minutes and you have 20 minutes to ask questions or clarify doubts, and I would be very happy to answer them. That works better if you want to learn. So, uh, uh, you know, when I was talking about history, just one slide on history and uh, diagnosis, is that always ask the patient their history. You know, that's something that we ought to do. Extraction is not having a hair cut. It is actually doing a procedure which involves several drugs that are injected, a prescription that's given later, and several complications that can occur, particularly in comorbid patients. So you need to check about allergies, uh, the kind of medications they're taking, and I can answer questions later on it. I'm not going into the details now. Uh, and uh, always ask about hospital admissions because it, it gives you a clue about what kind of problems a patient might have had. They may not tell you off, uh, right off what uh, kind of medical problems they have. If they have had general anesthesia, you know that they are reasonably fit because they wouldn't be taken up for general anesthesia unless they were fit and in the history. So these are some small tips that I can uh, give you, but we are going to get straight into the aspect of injection. The injection is a local anesthetic. Ironically, uh, the injection is a much feared thing and ironically, it is used to mitigate pain. But the injection itself is the most frightening thing for most dentists. I'm sorry, patients. So there are several issues. I mean, everybody, including me, we are all scared of needles. So there are several issues. One is with the pain of the injection itself, which is supposed to mitigate the pain of a procedure. Then there is the the fear that the injection may not work and there would be pain while the procedure is being done. Uh, you could aspirate, you could be into a blood vessel and aspiration would show you that you are into a blood vessel. And if you accidentally inject a local anesthetic into uh, intravascularly, you can have several complications, including toxicity and uh, cardiac side effects. Now, patients faint in our clinic, uh, Allergies have been reported, though I personally don't believe that there are allergies. And toxicity is one thing which dentists probably don't come across because we don't inject uh, large amounts of local anesthesia, but it is something that we need to be worried about. And there are other issues like, you know, broken needles, hematomas, and uh, accidental injections of other substances. I have had people injecting hydrogen peroxide and even formalin sometimes. I mean, they've been referred to me after uh, accidental injection. So all these kind of things come into play. I'm just mentioning this in the slide and uh, going back again to the uh, injection per se. Uh, as I said before, it's an absolute nightmare for the patient when he sees the needle. And the next few slides, I'm going to try to tell you how you can make this whole business of uh, giving a local anesthesia much more Pleasant, I mean, not pleasant, if not pleasant, not unpleasant is probably the word we need to use. So we have a big a list of local anesthetics that we can use. Um, lignocaine, along with adrenaline being the most common one. Then we have uh, BPVcaine, articaine. Articaine is something like the Olympic motto, you know, faster, longer, higher, etc. So, but, uh, uh, and uh, you have eutectic mixtures, which you can actually mix before you inject. It's supposed to be much more profound. But I'm going to stick with lignocaine with adrenaline because that's what most of us use all the time. A very important point I'd like to mention at this point is uh, the patient knows you're going to give them an injection. Uh, they see the syringe in your hand, but always, always tell your patient that you are going to give an injection. It's very important. Patients have told me this was a surprise. They do know that uh, injection has to be given for an extraction, but you always need to tell your patient, I'm going to give you an injection. It relaxes them. The ambience of the clinic is very important in getting relaxation for the patient. Uh, holding hands is what lovers do. Uh, I personally don't uh, think too much about holding a patient's hand or the patient holding your assistant's hand because they have other things to do. But uh, some dentists do allow patients to hold the hands of someone uh, close to them 
um, it's it's uh, it depends on the kind of practice that you have. So if they if you think that holding hands is going to make them more relaxed, well, go ahead and do that. Topical anesthetics again, it's not something that I use routinely because I I believe that topical anesthetics have a very low um, ro small role to play in actually mitigating pain because it's usually the needle pain alone that can be mitigated with uh, a topical anesthetic. The most common one is the lignocaine, which, occur, which, which you can get in 2% and 5% uh, strengths. And uh, probably the most effective one, which is cheap and easily available, is a 20% benzocaine. And you also have a EMLA, which is a, a equal 2.5%, uh, 2.5% of prilocaine and lignocaine, which is supposed to be superior to all these. And uh, you need to leave this um, uh, topical anesthetic at the point of injection for about five minutes for it to be effective. Uh, but as I said before, there are other things which are as if not more important because it is not the needle pain that people really find uh, unpleasant. It is actually the deposition of the local anesthetic into the tissues that is unpleasant. Uh, uh, there is no such thing as painless dentistry because there is some discrimination now. So they've used several kinds of methods to decrease this. You know, you have a patch just like they use for puncture. You have jet injections without needles, and you have the wand, which uh, periodontists like Joby probably uh, uh, promote to a large extent. It's a wand is a good uh, mechanism because it slows down the injection time and it gets a feedback on the amount of pressure building inside. Uh, I don't use any of these, so I really can't uh, talk too much about it. So going back to the topical application, benzocaine, let's assume that you're going to use benzocaine. You can uh, use a Johnson's earbud stick to uh, apply it in the mouth. But the most important thing, as I said, uh, and keep it for five minutes and then inject, it's not the entry of the needle that is actually painful. It is the deposition of the local anesthetic that is actually painful. So it, it, that's not a spelling mistake. Uh, the gap between S and L and O and W is meant to tell you, do it slowly. So if you inject a small bolus and then in continue to inject uh, subsequently over a period of uh, 30 seconds or a minute, you can have a relatively unpleasant uh, experience. It will not be as unpleasant as you, ex you expect. And always aspirate several times. It gives you, you know, each time you aspirate, it makes you slow down a bit. I mean, that's one of the techniques you can use to slow down. And pause between injections. It's very, very important that you uh, pause between as you inject so that the, the first dose of anesthetic uh, kicks in. Uh, it's also very important for us to know uh, the areas which are most painful. Most young dentists, it will take them a little time to understand that certain areas are more painful than the others. So the areas which are not painful, inferior alveolar block, for example, if you give it in the right place, the needle entering is usually painless. The same with the uh, uh, premolar and molar regions of the maxilla. But the anterior regions, the, the amount of uh, nerve endings, the concentration of nerve endings per square area in the anterior region, both maxilla and mandible, is much greater. It's a maximum in the lips. And <coughs> also the uh, greater palatine and nasopalatine blocks because of the dense tissue when the local anesthetic is deposited you can have a certain amount of pain so you need to be careful in these areas and probably this is the place what is written in red where you where uh, application of a local anesthetic uh, might help to decrease the uh, low topical anesthetic will help to decrease the pain the needles that we use, I use a, a one and a half inch needle, 26 gauge, um, you can use a 28 gauge, not much of a difference in that. And um, this should be long enough for you to be able to uh, uh, negotiate and reach the medial aspect of the mandible in a block. But in the, for infiltrations, uh, a lot of people use insulin needles. The 1.5 uh, mm or 2 mm, oh, sorry, 4 mm insulin needles. Now, these insulin needles are very thin and very painless. 
So if you want a tip here, use insulin needles for infiltrations. They are much less painless than the, um, uh, yeah, they are much, much more painless than the uh, conventional hypodermic needles. A lot of people use cartridges. I don't, but I have used cartridges. The big advantage of cartridges is that the needle is very thin again. It's, it's to do with the size of the needle. Uh, the disadvantage is that you can't aspirate, but then you have harpoon, harpoon plungers, which can be used for aspiration. So uh, that's something that you can think about as well if you're using cartridges. But uh, I use syringe, uh, uh, syringe for injections, and I'm quite happy with that. So aspiration, why do you aspirate? Uh, it's to inadvertently, to prevent the inadvertent injection of your local anesthetic into a blood vessel, which has, which as in the subsequent slides, I'm going to explain some of the problems that you can have with it. And if you are into a vessel, um, uh, very often in the inferior alveolar nerve block, as you get better with the inferior alveolar nerve block, the more chances of you actually hitting a blood vessel because you're closer to the point where you want to deliver it. And also in the palatal aspect, uh, the, you get, uh, uh, you hit the greater palatal artery from time to time. And uh, if you have a positive aspiration, which means blood is coming into your syringe, what do you do? You immediately stop and withdraw, discard the local anesthetic, and you can re-inject. The only problem is if you re-inject into an area which is already bleeding, you might get a second aspirate. But uh, the chances of going into another vessel a second time is very, very low. Um, some people postpone procedures. I don't think that's really necessary. And you can get hematomas in areas, uh, particularly in people who tend to bleed easily, you can get hematomas if you go into a blood vessel. Now, toxicity, as I said, dentists don't really encounter toxicity as much as uh, we think. The, the reason is we don't use very large amounts of lignocaine, and we're talking about lignocaine toxicity. So, 2% uh, lignocaine means about 25 milligrams of, uh, slightly less than that, milligrams of uh, lignocaine in every ml. And you can give up to 500 milligrams maximum. If you give more than that, and that is when you use it along with the adrenaline because adrenaline slows down the uptake of the local anesthetic. So when you use it with adrenaline, you can give up to 500 milligrams. And if you're not using adrenaline, your toxicity will kick in with just about half the amount. So as I said, dentists don't usually encounter this, but if you are planning to give a large amount, remember that the amount you inject is very important. So for a 70 kilogram person, the maximum you can inject is about 490. Don't go into the maths, look at the red. So you can inject up to 20 ml of local anesthetic if you are using it with adrenaline. And if you're not using adrenaline, you, can, you have to give less than half of the recommended 20 ml. I mean, the allowable, allowable 20 ml. So you just look at the red part of it, forget the mathematics. And uh, 20 ml, with adrenaline, 28 ml without adrenaline in a healthy person. So, which brings us to the question, uh, can we use adrenaline in cardiac patients? And this is an often asked question. The reason is because a lot of cardiologists would tell you, do not use adrenaline. Now, the problem is that you have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. And if you're not going in, you're not depositing the local anesthetic with adrenaline into a vessel, then, you are perfectly within justified in using adrenaline even in a cardiac patient. In fact, it is recommended. The reason is that if by not using adrenaline, you are going to cause pain while doing the procedure, you are going to produce stress and the amount of adrenaline secreted endogenously by the patient is approximately 280 micrograms, which is much, much more than what would be produced by your, the adrenaline that you mix with your local anesthetic. So it is much safer to use adrenaline as long as you use it within, with the proper guidelines, which I'm coming to. Now, in a healthy patient, absolutely healthy patient with no cardiac problems, you can inject, as we said earlier, 20 ml of local anesthetic with adrenaline. There's absolutely no problem. But if your patient is a cardiac patient, is a hypertensive, uh, has uh, the possibility of uh, the myocardium being sensitized to the use uh, to, uh, uh, to a catecholamine, then 
you should not give more than 5 ml of local anesthetic. This is the guideline and it should not be intravascular by any chance and even injecting into a uh, hyperemic tissue like you know an infl inflamed tissue can actually increase uptake of adrenaline. So it should be less than between 4 and 5 ml is a maximum that you can use for a patient who has got a cardiac problem and it's absolutely safe to use it if it's less than 4 ml. So I hope you understand the toxicity of lignocaine and the problems with adrenaline and you need to collate both of them when you are planning a procedure extraction. Uh, we all know what I'm just going to briefly touch on the positioning. Of course, the mandible has to be parallel to the floor. Um, I still do standing dentistry. I belong to an old school. But uh, even when you're lying down, the same principle holds good. Now, one of the things that I've observed, I just, this is just a point, and there are several others, but a uh, point I'm going to highlight here is when you ask people to open their mouth, they usually open their mouth in a crooked way to allow you to place, put the injection. Now, that is going to make it difficult to give you a block particularly in your, um, for your inferior alveolar nerve block. So asking them to open their mouths, say ah, without um, making the mouth crooked is a good way of accessing the area that you want to inject. Uh, I am experienced because I was in a government college, I've been giving local anesthesia uh, in large, uh, in a large number of people before I even graduated. So uh, today you need to uh, use a lot of signs and landmarks to identify the place where you want to give. But generally speaking, I'm not going to go into that. Generally speaking, in front of the periomandibular raphe, uh, at the deepest point when you palpate from the external oblique ridge posteriorly, and at the deepest point, uh, move the tissue aside, as so we go a little medial and move the tissue aside, and from the opposite side, I use a direct tech all the time and I find it extremely good uh, you would and the tip of the needle goes close to or touches the medial aspect of the mandible at the point where the inferior alveolar nerve enters the mandible and if you deposit your local anesthetic there withdraw slightly for the lingual nerve and give a long buccal nerve you get a perfect inferior alveolar nerve anesthesia. Uh, going to the maxilla uh, there's a common mistake everybody makes is to inject uh, parallel to the teeth. You always need to inject at a 45 degree angle as shown in the picture. This ensures for both blocks as well as infiltrations that you get much more profound anesthesia and you avoid complications like going to the uh, um, pterygoid venous plexus and things like that. So this is something and I've seen even postgraduates uh, not giving the infiltration in the maxilla correctly, 45 degree angle towards the root of the tooth. Point to the root of the tooth and give it. So the biggest uh, concern that we have is uh, what if my injection fails? So what do you do? I mean, uh, various reasons. Uh, ineffective local anesthetic. Either, I mean, if it's past expiry date, there's a possibility that uh, it may not be working. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to highlight is most of us use multi uh, uh, multi-dose vials, 10 ml vials, and uh, you put a needle into the uh, anesthetic bottle, and if you keep it there, or if it is exposed to the outside, the effectiveness of the local anesthesia decreases significantly if you're not finishing the bottle in one, which most of us probably wouldn't be able to do. So uh, you need to be aware of that. Never leave, a the, the local anesthetic should never be exposed to the outside through the needle even. It will decrease the uh, effectiveness of the anesthetic. The technique is one of the reasons why local anesthesia most often fails because we do not or we do not have because of the number of dental colleges the the amount of opportunities for giving local anesthesia for extractions is much less in especially in private institutions. So you need to work on that and uh, develop your technique which is foolproof. Every block and I, I obviously can't go into every block here but uh, it is something that you need to pay attention to. And of course, anatomical variations and aberrant nerve supplies uh, in the best of situations might cause a failure of anesthesia. So if a patient tells you that they've got pain, believe them, give another injection. So you can inject as many times as you want, as long as you follow the rule of not exceeding 20 ml with adrenaline. Now there are a lot of techniques. I don't, I've never used most of these techniques
techniques that I've used for my academic purposes, but I'm sorry, the Gauguets, the echinose is something that I use, especially in patients who have trismus. Um, the, uh, simply put, the needle goes, hits the anterior border of the uh, ramus, and then you move the needle medially and uh, pass it through the soft tissue and deposit the local anesthesia about an inch from the mucosa. The, the point of entry should be above the occlusal line. It's called a close mouth technique. I can also, also call the Wazirani technique. There's an Indian involved on this Independence Day. We should probably acknowledge uh, the contribution of uh, uh, India to the Akinosis technique, as it's called, Akinosis as Wazirani technique. And uh, I don't use any of the others. Um, it's purely academic. The periodontal ligament injection, you can use small amounts and it just anesthetizes that particular tooth. Uh, I'm sure you can read about that. So we get into the extraction of teeth. Now you can ask me questions at the end about anything that you want clarified uh, to the best of my knowledge and I'll try to answer them. So you have this large uh, armamentarium that you can gather. And you know, if you put the armamentarium of uh, every country and every group of people who do extractions, uh, it would fill up several tables because you have a number of um, uh, forceps and elevators, which uh, most of them uh, uh, are personal preferences. Uh, I'll tell you something else, some of the useful ones, which I have felt useful, I'll tell you as we go down uh, this thing. But so you have forceps, you have periosteal elevators, you have uh, elevators for uh, um, uh, mobilizing the tooth, you have uh, uh, root forceps, you have uh, bone cutting instruments as in uh, chisels and mallets, which is not being used at all. I don't use them at least anymore. Uh, micromotors and burrs. I will just touch on all those things as we go. So, but one of the most important things, you know, the fundamental principle of doing an extraction is something that all of us should be familiar with. Um, the important thing is that you need to raise a mucoperiosteal flap. And that is absolutely required. That's the only way you can expose the cemento enamel region of the tooth. And your beak needs, and uh, you use a periosteal elevator to do that. And this is something that you need to do very, very assiduously and very carefully because uh, it has a lot of bearing on how your extraction goes. And this is to enable the beak of your forceps to grasp the tooth. Now, it, all, it should always be, you see the wrong and the right, it should always be as far as possible at or apical to the cemento enamel junction. That way you can almost ensure that your tooth is never going to fracture. And this is true of anterior teeth as well as for posterior teeth, for lower as well as for upper. The lower you have, we use in India, right angle kind of forceps. So those, the beaks of those forceps, again, should go as deep as possible. That, that apical positioning of the beak of your forceps is very important. The next thing is the long axis of the tooth. Your instrument should be in line with the long axis of the tooth. If it is not, the chances of fracture is much more. I think the picture uh, explains that situation quite uh, clearly. And of course, as you can see, the grip is apical to the uh, cemento enamel junction. Just a picture of a tooth being extracted. As I said, even for the lower, we use a meat forceps. But in the US, they use uh, something like an, what looks like an upper forceps, but it has a right angle. Uh, it's useful in some situations, like, uh, but I find it, uh, I find this much more convenient, probably we're used to it. So hold it so that your tip of your beak is apical to the cemento enamel junction. It's a very important point. And it should be at the long axis, the beak should be in the long axis of the tooth. If you do these two things, there's very little possibility of you actually fracturing the tooth. Uh, you have a whole range of instruments. Now you have periotomes, which you can use to actually slowly work your tooth out of its socket without losing any bone. These are all implant driven. They are very useful. The beaks themselves have different, kind, different kinds of engineering that goes into uh, ergonomic uh, ways in which to grasp and extract your teeth. Um, I still use my father's 40 year old or 50-year-old ash forceps. Um, 
I don't know what I'll do. I, I hope it uh, uh, survives uh, until my retirement. Uh, you have the atomic physics forceps, which has one sharp end and one which is the single. It, it, I, I can understand how it works. I have not used it personally, but uh, uh, these are uh, relatively atomic, and uh, they say that even the teeth that are likely to break will not break if you use this thing. I do not know too much about it. I have not used it, yeah, but I am sure that there are several of you who have used it and uh, who can probably attest to its uh, advantages. And you have fancy things. Uh, this is like a fishing rod. You actually reel the tooth out of the uh, socket. Minimal uh, trauma. Uh, you actually you know, put an instrument into the pulp and uh, right up to the root and then uh, reel it out. Uh, I'm sure the younger people are going to see more and more of these things uh, coming in uh, over the years. And uh, uh, I'm sure you can adapt to the technology as and how it comes. Now, if you do all these things, you expect that a root, uh, tooth will not fracture. Let me tell you, after so many years of practice, your teeth will still fracture. And if they fracture, you need to have a strategy to remove it. It's, it's an open method. We call it an open method right now. You can call it surgical extractions, but then, as I said, extractions themselves are surgical, so that's a, a superfluous term to use. So elevate the gums as you would do in your regular extractions. Uh, with, the, with the periosteal elevator and access the tooth because you have to see the tooth if you want to grasp it. And if you try blindly to try to grasp the tooth without seeing it properly, you're going to cause a lot of soft tissue trauma and pain after extraction. The main reason is soft tissue trauma, as you can see, something like this. This is the most painful part of it. If you do not traumatize the soft tissue, you will not have pain. Uh, Get a good x-ray so that you can plan your procedure. You can get an IOPA, which has got uh, um, much better resolution than an OPG, but an OPG is also fine, especially in uh, areas which are difficult to access like the third molar. Uh, I use the prop very, very, in a very limited way, but a prop is good because, especially in people who tend to close their mouth as you do a procedure, and uh, when you place a prop properly, uh, you would uh, you can uh, avoid undue pressure on the opposite TM joint, especially when you're removing lower teeth and things like that. So those of you who would like to use it can use it. Uh, tongue depressor is not something that I use, but uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention many of these slides are from Dr. Umanaju Jacobs' presentation. Uh, many of them, many of them are mine as well. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, several of these pictures. He uses a tongue depressor, so. Uh, I don't, but uh, I use a mouth mirror. You, you can use it. It's, it's a useful instrument. Use readily available everywhere. The periosteal elevator, the single most uh, um, useful thing, I think I would be lost if I didn't have it, was a periosteal. We have a mold periosteal elevator and the freer, but uh, these are available everywhere. And there's one called the Mitchell trimmer, which I use, but I don't use it for extractions. I use it for uh, uh, cleft palate surgery. I don't do much of them these days, but uh, it's a very useful thing. But basically, they are all used for uh, freeing up the periosteum from the bone. And uh, once you've done that, you need to cut bone, usually make a gutter, and you can use a round or a flat fissure. I use a fissure burr normally uh, on a micro motor, of course. So these are very useful and plenty of irrigation whenever you use burrs. That's absolutely important to prevent uh, poor healing because of thermal issues. Uh, cheek retractor, these are all optional. I, another one of my very, very favorite instruments is a crossbar elevator. I use it all the time and um, everybody would have their own choice of instruments, but um, uh, this is my favorite uh, elevator in addition to the straight elevator. So let's look at a pos of, a, of, a, of a situation where there is a hollow tooth. It's like a, it's like an eggshell, and there's a high possibility you 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 uh, elevate the uh, mucoperiosteum and get a good grip. And despite everything that you do, you fracture the tooth. Now this is when you say, "Oh no!" Uh, now I, I remember I used to be much more uh, worried about it those days than I am now. So what do you do? You can't, you can't actually grip the tooth because it is lying, it's, it's broken below the level of the bone. You don't even think twice. 
get a mucoperiosteal flap, look at what you have, clean it up, it's, it's a poor photograph, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, have a look at the tooth. You should be able to see the tooth very clearly. And um, you can use, again, this is a bad photograph, I think I have a better one after this to show you. You can make a gutter in order to expose the roots. Now, uh, this is in a situation for an impaction where the crown is still there. And if you want to use the same principle, you can make a small dent in the tooth and use your crossbar elevator by purchasing into it and lifting it out. And if it's, there are dilacerated teeth, it may not happen so easily. You need to split the tooth. Splitting the tooth is a very, very good way of removing one root and then the other root. Usually once you've removed one root, you can put your crossbar elevator into that socket and remove the other root. Uh, just to show you the guttering process. You can see the gutter here. Uh, you can see, I don't know if this, yeah, you can see the gutter here. Unless you do guttering, you will not be able to see the tooth. And if you can't see the tooth, it's very difficult to remove it. So go ahead and remove bone so that the tooth is exposed, the broken tooth or root. And uh, you need to suture them. And when you suture them, uh, what I do is I always suture the relieving incision, the, the vertical releasing incision first, and then suture the other one. You can use absorbable sutures, you can use non-absorbable sutures. Both of them are fine, but using non-absorbable absorbable sutures is expensive. So uh, you may want to put sutures which are uh, non-absorbable and then remove them after seven days. So as I said, soft tissue is the main cause, soft, soft tissue trauma is the main cause for pain and delayed healing. Now the maxillary third molar is an issue with some people, but I find it one of the easiest extractions to do. But uh, every once in a way, you will have what is called the tuberosity fracture. Now that's very disconcerting. If you if you have raised the mucoperiosteum very well, uh, it won't do much of damage. But if you haven't, you will get tears into the palate and tears into the buccal aspect. And that can be very disconcerting because it heals very slowly and it's a very painful thing. A lot of people do not use a straight elevator. I do use a straight elevator, but a Warwick James elevator is something that's strongly recommended for removal of these teeth. And of course, forceps, the forceps delivery, like they say in gynecology, is something that probably would lessen the chance of a tuberosity fracture. There's nothing wrong with the tuberosity fracture if you can close it, but when you have the patient's going to have a denture subsequently, a primary stress bearing area might be lost, but uh, usually it's not a significant problem, even if you have a tuberosity fracture. Every once in a way, you have a, rarely do eights create crowns fracture, but if that happens, or if you have an impacted upper eight which you want to remove, you do the releasing incision in the manner that is shown, a releasing incision, and raise the mucoperiosteum flap, and then you have this wonderful instrument called the Laster Retractor. I'm sure most of you haven't heard about it. It's a, it's, it's like a, a alila, it's like a leaf, you know, and um, it's got a small curvature at the end, and you can pass it under the mucoperiosteal flap and take it right up to the pterygomaxillary area and lever it outward, lever it outward, and you'll have an excellent uh, 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 exposition of the uh, upper eight. And uh, you can use your burr, the burr will go into the concavity of this retractor. It's a very, very convenient uh, uh, forceps. And this forceps is a uh, uh, Cirac Surgicals in Chennai uh, makes uh, this particular forceps. You buy it in the UK, it's going to cost you about 90 pounds, uh, but I think it's much, much less here. Uh, not too many people have started using it, but if you have an opportunity, uh, try to get this uh, particular instrument. It's a very useful instrument. I got it about three or four years back and uh, um, I'm so happy with it. it. It takes a lot of stress out of the upper molar difficult situations. Um, but last molar difficult situations. Sutures, some people put sutures, are they really necessary? It's a very, very personal preference, but if you have, if you have raised a mucoperiosteal flap, obviously you must put a Switcher, especially if you have a releasing incision. And then if there are possibilities of bleeding and uh, you're putting a hemostatic into the socket and you want to keep it there, you obviously do need a suture. Now, uh, the preferred sutures are, of course, swatched needles and suture materials. Now, the problem is that uh, they're expensive. And if you're going to put only one suture 
it might be expensive in the Indian context, at least in now practices, we find that expensive. So if you're using uh, uh, a needle with a hole, it's called a traumatic switcher. The other one is an atraumatic switcher. Now you can make the atraumatic switcher as, I'm sorry, a traumatic switcher as atraumatic as possible by a small tricks, but I'll come to that. You have uh, needle holders, I'm sure all these instruments you have. Dentists tend not to use uh, tissue, soft tissue forceps, a tooth tissue forceps. Uh, use it, it's very, very convenient when you're putting in sutures. And of course you have suture needle. You see. So this is a small technique, uh, it's there in Laskin, uh, but today with uh, swatched needles uh, and uh, suture materials, they're not used much. But just look at the pictures and see if you can get a hang of it. You, you pass the thread through the eye of the needle and then loop it around the tip and bring it back and again pass it through the eye and you'll have the situation. And you pull it up and you don't put a knot there, but it's relatively atraumatic. You can use this in your practice, it might be useful. And this is just to show you how to use a tissue holding forceps and put a suture, suture. Elegant. Now tooth extraction is a surgery and it needs a certain amount of elegance to do it. Now, what are the common complications? Um, at the end of my talk, uh, the biggest problem is when you break a root, oh damn, it's gone. The root is broken. Should I leave it or remove it? A lot of people will tell you that if you leave a root behind, you're doing something terribly wrong. It isn't. You can absolutely leave a root behind. Nothing would happen really. And if it's a small bit, in all possibility, as long as it's not infected, if it's infected, it usually comes out easily. Uh, if you leave a small, uh, root tip, uh, you are justified, especially if you have to remove a lot of bone around it and you have to endanger other anatomical structures like nerves and arteries or the maxillary sinus or displace it into the lingual spaces. Uh, it's not really worth going into that as long as you explain. So this is a situation where a root tip has gone into the, gone through the lingual plate into the lingual space. And that's, that's a difficult situation because then you need a surgery, it becomes much more complicated. So, Document, whenever you break a root, don't, don't think that you've done something terribly wrong. I break teeth all the time. Uh, I remove them most of the time, but sometimes I choose to not do it. And uh, for the reasons I mentioned, you don't want to endanger some other structure. Uh, it will get resolved. It might sometimes work its way up to the surface and they'll come back to you and you can get it done, uh, extracted again. Um, sometimes it may get infected and if it gets infected, it will be thrown out of the body. So there's no great danger in leaving a root behind and I don't think legally there is a big issue as long as you document it and tell the patient that a root tip is left behind. You inform them about it or you could refer them of course. This is just an example to show you when a patient comes back with a toothache, you take an x-ray and you find a root there which is left behind from a previous extraction. It's not done any harm. The pain is from another tooth. So you can comfortably leave almost a whole length of a root and still get away with it. And in fact, if you try to remove it, you can have much graver consequences, like for example, a fracture of the mandible, which is also a complication, uh, which I see from time to time. And I very, uh, without telling, even telling the dentist who's done it, uh, I just put a plate in on the local and then send them away. But uh, you don't want the situation because it's legally very, very problematic. Now, post-extraction bleeding. Bleeding is something that everybody is afraid of. I think uh, it's a topic by itself, so I'm going to just touch on it. Uh, you need to identify the bleeding point and pressure. Pressure is the best way of stopping bleeding. And rarely you might have to cauterize it. I'm sure all dentists don't have a cautery in their clinics, but if you have one, it's very useful. Uh, hemostatics, I don't trust them too much, especially the number of pharmacological hemostatics that are being sold to dentists. Most of them don't work. It's the pressure that works finally. And of course, sutures. So there are several risks from bleeding. I mean, today you have you can have coagulation disorders. Uh, a lot of people who are comorbid and take antiplatelet drugs or taking anticoagulant therapy. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into that. You can have bone marrow disorders like myeloproliferative disorders or myelo. Uh, of bone marrow depression, which can cause bleeding, including lymph, uh, uh, lymphomas, uh, leukemias, uh, and those kind of malignancies. HIV AIDS uh, causes uh, low platelet uh, or low platelet performance, and it can cause bleeding. And uh, conditions like dengue and things like that also. 
produce thrombocytopenia. So you need to be uh, uh, conscious about all these possibilities. But the main purpose and the main line of treatment is first stop the blood loss. And if it doesn't stop with the routine techniques that I'm going to explain in the next two slides, remember it is not a dental reason for the bleeding, refer it. So relax the patient, bring the BP down, put a nice pressure pack, and if it doesn't stop, use some operative techniques, just a picture. Usually it's because of granulation tissue, either due to periodontal disease or periapical tissue disease. Cure the socket nicely and uh, place a gel foam. I, I, the only hemostatic that I use regularly is a gel foam. Easily available, not very expensive. Place it inside and if you see no active bleeding, place a suture and give a pressure pack and you'll be fine. Now, if it doesn't stop with that, you are in trouble. There's something else. If you've curated it nicely and you've placed a hemostatic gel foam and if you've sutured it and it doesn't stop, there's a point to be worried. Uh, several uh, hemostatics in the same genre are available. Uh, uh, surgery cell and uh, uh, bone waxes are expensive and probably not don't play a very big role in routine extractions, but go with gel foam. Uh, and when you look, when you deal with bleeding, always remember that you need good lighting, good assistance, and a nice uh, suction tip. Now, I see a lot of dentists who use the dental suction tip. Uh, that is not good for surgery in the mouth, anything. Use a metal suction tip and it's very, very useful. And if you don't, if you only have a dental suction tip, you can always use your common sense to make a connector and then fix it to your regular suction and that works. So uh, Abgel, that's the gel foam, is what I would strongly recommend. Bone, wa bone wax, very, very rarely, maybe a couple of times in your lifetime of dentistry. And if you see a bleeding spot, sometimes you, when you do multiple extractions, you can see bleeding spots. You can use a cautery. I think I, I would advise everybody to have a cautery or a, a RF um, thermocoagulator with you. And if you don't have that, you can use your endodontic burnisher. Heat it nicely. Right? Or don't burn the lips. Apply it on the bleeding spot and it'll stop bleeding. Uh, this is an algorithm. So it's more or less everything I said. So if the bleeding doesn't stop with the routine mechanisms that you deploy, remember that there may be another cause and it's not in your hands to deal with it. Send it to a hospital-based dentist, a maxillofacial surgeon, or even to a physician. If the bleeding continues beyond six hours or eight hours and you're not able to stop it with the routine procedures. Dry sockets are quite common. Um, five to 10% of all impactions go in for dry sockets, but you can get it anywhere. Um, typically, it's dry. There's nothing in the socket. And uh, why do you get it? People say it's because of traumatic extractions and oral contraceptives. The real reason is really not known. What we do know is that there is uh, fibrinolysis. The clot breaks down due to some reason. It may be bacteria. It may be some kind of a chemical or a innate um, fibronectin has been... Uh, Decreased levels of fibronectin have been blamed. So we don't know exactly what it is, but we do know what to do about it. So it can occur anywhere, as I said, but most often in the impacted eighth region. And uh, usually the pain starts two to three days. That's a classic way in which you can uh, identify it. Two to three days after the extraction, they're okay in the first two, three days. And then you have pain and foul smelling, um, uh, um, unhealed socket. And then you know that it's a dry socket. The simple way, not a curettage really, I, I wouldn't advise a curettage, but you know, irrigate it properly, remove any debris inside. And the eugenol pack is what I use. Cotton and eugenol pack together, put it into the socket, allow it to sit. And until a layer of granulation tissue forms uh, in the socket, you will have pain. So you may have to change the pack once, twice, thrice, but eventually it will be all right. Assure the patient that there's nothing serious and it's not an infection and it's not your fault really. Uh, Post-extraction trismus is something else that happens. It can happen because of your local anesthetic. If you inject into the pterygomandibular raffae, if you have muscle spasm, you can get it. You can also get it because of a uh, uh, patient doesn't open the mouth for a long period of time. There's some fibrosis in the muscles around and you can have trismus. Uh, also, 
active infections can cause trismus. But it's usually because of uh, inadequate amount of mouth opening after an extraction or because of spasm of muscles from the injection. And uh, I use a Haster mouth opener. It's a screw type thing. It costs about 1,000, 1,200 rupees. It's an extremely good instrument to use. Uh, a lot of people say ice cream sticks. Uh, I think ice cream sticks are very, very good for eating ice creams. I really don't find a use for it. Uh, you can use manual opening. You can use these um, equipment for opening up the mouth slowly. And uh, muscle relaxants by themselves don't really cure Christmas, but a muscle relaxant will help in controlling the pain, particularly when they're doing the physiotherapy to open up. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to, I already exceeded my time. So as uh, he said, extraction is a surgery and he who wishes to go to war should have the implements to deal with it. So if you've got good equipment, good instruments and uh, good training uh, and use common sense, I think you can get away with a surgery in the mouth with ease. So thank you very much. Uh, this is what I have to say. If you have any questions, you would always put the questions to me. I try to answer to the best of my ability. Yeah. Sir, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. That's a perfect, sir. You, you are spot on. <laughs> you are spot on, sir. You started at, uh, I think, uh, 9.40 and only five more minutes you extended, sir. That's all, Yeah, sir. I'm five sorry about minutes. that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's not a big issue, sir. Uh, uh, so there are some questions, uh, Dr. Binu. Uh, I'm... There are so many questions, sir, uh, that is coming. Uh, yeah, we, I can we, take a few questions. Uh, over yeah. your 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Binu? Yes, uh, Javi, there are so many messages in the chat box. Just let me just go through it quickly. Um, Everyone is saying so amazing, sir. The chat box is filled up. So oh, I, I won't thank you very much. You. Yeah. Yeah. One request to all those candidates, please come to the WhatsApp group that you are added and please respond there. If any question I can forward to sir and I get you a personal message, don't worry. So whichever group you are in, in the WhatsApp, uh, the, the, the doubts, please put, please criticize us, please tell your doubts, we can address that. So yeah, you can, can, ask, you can, can I... criticize me, you can, I mean, I just said what I, what I thought was uh, my, my way of practicing, but I'm sure there are better ways and uh, better ideas. So, and uh, I can't promise that I would just, answer uh, all your questions. Can I just I... ask some questions? Yeah. Can read out some things that came in the group quickly? Um, well, I, we, I'm sure, I, mean, I, I, I hope people uh, enjoyed it. I think we'll go to the questions, really. I'm... Okay, I'm, I'm gonna read out some questions quickly, sir. So, or can we use laser for cot rising? You can. I, I, I personally, I have a feeling that the laser is a much, uh, uh, it's a very fancy equipment, really. Uh, it works like a knife. I mean, you can use a laser like a knife. You can use a laser. Uh, you don't have to use as much local anesthesia. That's the advantage. You can use it to stop bleeding, but not uh, enormous amount of bleeding. So, what you can do with a burnisher, you can do with a laser as well. Uh, I'm sure you can do it. Yes, you can. But I would prefer a cautery. I use an RF, radio frequency thermocorrelator. That's, that's, doesn't burn up. In what disease does the anesthesia fail? In what Sorry? disease does the anesthesia fail? I mean, there's no particular disease where it fails. As I said, it fails if the uh, anesthetic is uh, expired. It fails if your technique is not right. It fails if you have uh, aberrant nerve supplies. But I don't think there's any ear disease as such where your anesthesia fails. Why is there redu reduced action of LA in case of cysts and abscess? <coughs> okay, okay, okay. That's, uh, I mean, it needs a big answer, really. Not so much in cysts, but in abscesses, yes. See, uh, what you need to understand is that um, it is the uh, local base element of the local anesthesia that acts to produce uh, 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 anesthesia. Now, if you have an infection, that area is acidic in nature. And uh, the local anesthetic, if you look at the bottle, it says lignocaine hydrochloride. It is made into an acid salt. That's the only way it will actually dissolve. So when you inject an acid 
salt solution into an acidic media, that dissociation of that molecule will not take place. So, because the body is also acidic when there's infection because of PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid. So that's the reason why it doesn't work. So for the anesthetic to work, you should have a, it should be injected into a more alkaline 7.4 is the pH of the tissues. There it will dissociate. But in an infection, the, it, the uh, tissue will not be as uh, alkaline and therefore dissociation takes place slowly. It's, it's theoretical. So I mean, so I don't know uh, how well I can explain it, but if you've understood it, that's the reason, but, it, uh, but you're right, it doesn't work. That's the reason. What, why. Is the, what is the protocol of stopping aspirin and antiplatelet before extraction? Okay, I avoided that because that's a big explanation, but uh, uh, who, well, first of all, you don't have to stop uh, antiplatelet drugs. The current uh, uh, um, position on it by the American Heart Association, by uh, all uh, statutory bodies and uh, groups, is that you don't have to stop aspirin. In fact, in patients who have had stents, you should not stop aspirin. Because the, if you weigh the risk and the benefit, uh, withdrawing aspirin can cause a, a, a coagulation problem, which can be much more dangerous, really. So uh, you don't have to stop aspirin. But if you feel that somebody's taking um, aspirin as a, as a prophylactic, as I am, and uh, you don't want to have as much bleeding, then you can stop it. But the bleeding cost due to an antiplatelet is very, very low. It's not the same with anticoagulants. Anticoagulants are you know, more problematic, warfare and sodium and things like that. So there you have to actually preferably refer it to a hospital-based uh, dental setup or to a maxillofacial surgeon or somebody who's familiar with it. And uh, usually it requires, you, you know, the... INR, anticoagulants are given to keep the INR, international, international normalized ratio, uh, at a high level to prevent uh, coagulation. So if you stop the anticoagulant, you're going to have a rebound coagulopathy. So you don't actually stop the anticoagulant, you substitute it with a clexine or something like that. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. heparin can be used, you can use... Uh, um, various other substitutes to keep the, uh, the, the medical situation under control. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big discussion, really. I don't know if I can really... I know, I, I know, sir. Yeah, Binu, See, Binu, are, Binu, uh, Binu, can, can I... Other questions coming Binu, up Binu. like, uh, sir, how to extract an impacted Binu, third Binu, wall Binu. So okay. that yes. is, it will require three years to explain yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Binu, Dr. Binu can, I, can I interrupt? There are some questions from the, uh, the YouTube. Can I just... One important please, please. question from the YouTube. Uh, live is uh, uh, dry socket, is it common for diabetes or is it common for uh, smokers? Yeah, there was a theory that uh, smokers tend to get, and you know, I, I remember people used to say, don't smoke because you might you can get a dry socket. But I don't think there is evidence-based uh, proof to show that smokers actually develop more uh, dry sockets. Uh, diabetics, no, it's not because of that. As I said, it is fibrinolysis. For some reason, the clot doesn't stabilize and breaks down. So you have to wait for granulation tissue to form on the bone and then for it to heal secondarily. I mean, all, all, all of them heal secondarily, but it takes a little more time to think. But um, um, contraceptives, uh, there are quite a few studies which show that contraceptives have been shown to cause dry sockets. Traumatic extractions, I mean, I have done traumatic extractions and no dry socket has uh, happened. I've done perfectly all right, uh, I mean, very smooth extraction procedures where dry socket, uh, it has exactly. resulted in dry socket. So it just happens. I think we don't know. That's okay, sir. sir, one more question from the YouTube uh, is that, uh, sir, can, how to give a nasopalatine nerve block less painful? Yeah, one of the things that see one uh, one reason why the nasopalatine uh, nerve block is very painful is because uh, it's a very dense tissue, and uh, we inject a lot of uh, local anesthetic. So one of the techniques that have been said is you can give uh, on the buccal aspect if you give a little local, then uh, it uh, seems to seep down down the papilla, and you may have a little less pain when you give the nasopalatine block. The secret of it is you need very, very small amounts of uh, local anesthetic to be injected. And the other reason is probably you're not inside the nasopalatine canal. 
if you are injecting into dense uh, soft tissue, yes, you will have pain. Um, you can apply the topical anesthetic to a certain extent to decrease pain, but it is a problem. Yes, and uh, you need to know how to do a give a correct nasopelatine block to avoid that situation of wrong place being injected and therefore pain. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Binu, anything more? If we leave the root, there are chances for cyst formation? Question mark. Not really. Okay. Well, well, if there is a periapical um, granuloma around the uh, root tip that you have left behind, yes, there is a possibility that it can happen. But it's only as much of a possibility as uh, a, a tooth which has a periapical lesion. So that is not a reason to uh, uh, endanger an anatomical structure or anything like that and go into it. If you really are worried about it, always take an X-ray uh, after about two months or three months and see if it's going into a cyst, if it's forming into a cyst. If you can do it, do it, or you can refer it to somebody to do it. But the important thing about broken roots are always tell your patient that there is a broken root. An interesting question, what inspired you to take, uh, uh, in, inspired you to become a lawyer? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's a personal question, of course. Well, I, I, I never was very um, interested in going into health sciences at all. Uh, I am more uh, of a humanities person. I... Mm, like reading a lot, I liked literature, I liked economics, I liked uh, a lot of other uh, areas, economics and uh, not so much commerce, yeah. So uh, I was forced to do dentistry because my father made me become a dentist. And uh, so after I became a dentist and I had to go and visit my wife in Bangalore, I came to know there was an evening college uh, uh, available to do an LLB. So I took the opportunity to do it but I wrote the examination only 10 years later. I, I am a lawyer, I'm a qualified lawyer today, but uh, I, I gave it up at one point of time after I finished the course. And then I went and wrote all the papers together in one shot and got through in 2002. That's how I became a lawyer. <laughs> Just an aspirational thing, something I was interested in in humanities here. That's great, sir. That's great, sir. So you better half made you better. I'm sorry? You better half made you better. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know if it's better, but <laughs> she's made me better in many other ways. <laughs> okay. yeah. That's great, sir. That's great, sir. That, that's a great inspiration to all of us. I'm just checking. Yobi, just want to check the groups. There are a lot of uh, questions that are coming in the WhatsApp groups. Just check, check that. I'll just check the chat box. Okay. What to do if a patient is allergic to local anesthetic? <laughs> Uh, this is a rapid fire, rapid fire for you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, see, this is, you know, uh, uh, 25 years. Uh, I was in uh, Trandrum Dental College when they celebrated the 25th anniversary. I was there again when they celebrated the 50th anniversary. They do about 300, they give about 300 injections every day in the oral surgery department. And in 50 years, not a single patient actually developed an allergy. So there was allergy to procaine in the initial years. And a lot of physicians and surgeons tell me that they have allergy. I think it might have been toxicity that they're talking about. True allergy in my lifetime, my father's lifetime, and in the Trivandrum Dental College's lifetime has never been reported. So I think it is just a fallacy. People do not have allergy to local anesthesia, not to the modern local anesthetics. The, the, the old one, Procaine used to have, and there was some allergy to the preservatives that were used in the early years of uh, local anesthesia, not anymore. You know, can I can I can I address one question? The group, the WhatsApp sure, go group. Go ahead. How, how to remove bucko converted maxillary third molar? Which instrument is the best to use? Elevator or third molar forceps? Well, a bucko version uh, uh, is actually very easy to remove. Uh, I use a straight elevator and it comes out. But um, uh, different people, my. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, Doctor, also my brother-in-law, Dr. Umanaju Jacob uses a Warwick James elevator because you have to raise the periosteum and things like that. And there are some very uh, nifty looking uh, forceps which, have, uh, which I use specifically for uh, last models. I, I can't show it to you. Uh, they engage very well, but usually elevation will get the tooth out, either with a Warwick James or a, Warwick James, uh, or a straight elevator. I use a straight elevator, but Warwick James is the one which most people would use, yes. 
Uh, we have a question uh, in one of the groups from a very senior orthodontist in the country. What about use of alveo alveogil yeah, yeah. for dry socket? Yeah, I, I think I probably was one of the earliest people to use alveogil in India because I used to go on these humanitarian projects and I saw this thing uh, uh, in one of the clinics there and I brought it back. Um, uh, honestly speaking, uh, it was disappointing for me because uh, a lot of people, I mean, it's, it's being sold now in India very, I'm, I'm talking about 25, 30 years ago. So it's being used very uh, widely now, but I still think that uh, cotton mixed with uh, zinc, zinc oxide eugenol is the best uh, optindin that you can use in a dry socket. Alveogel is expensive, so therefore people think that it's better. We always think that expensive things are better, isn't it? So, well, it has a role perhaps, but I don't know. Uh, I personally didn't uh, find it particularly useful. I prefer using. So, all I have to use something other than an, uh, zinc oxide eugenol. This thing I would use a bismuth iodoform small pack of uh, bismuth iodoform, which you get as a thing. I use it for cysts, so it's available in my clinic. So I sometimes use that. Yes. So one question sir, in the group, sir. Uh, should we compress the socket after extraction? Is it mandatory? Oh, sure. yeah. Absolutely, you must do it. If I didn't say it, uh, I missed something there. Yes, you must. So you must compress the socket. It helps in healing. It helps in, uh, especially if you're going to do mul you're doing multiple extractions and uh, you're going to replace the tooth there. A compressed socket is uh, very useful. You don't have to do an alveolectomy later, and also right. it decreases the chance of bleeding, better healing. Yeah. Sir one, sir, one question is that if the patient is having a periapical abscess, suffering from periapical abscess, uh, will the LA will work or any other methodology is there uh, where you, you, we can improvise the LA or effectiveness of the LA? Okay, uh, if you're talking about the mandible, uh, you're giving the block at a point distant to the actual tooth. And if you give a sufficient amount of uh, local anesthesia around it as well, it use, usually works. And, but if you have an abscess, I mean, one of the ways of draining an abscess is by extracting the tooth. That's one way mm -hmm. of doing it. Yeah. But uh, if there is a fluctuant abscess that is uh, visible, you can do an IND, wait for the um, abscess to uh, uh, heal, and then go ahead and do the extraction. Uh, in the maxilla, if you have a periapical abscess, I think uh, you'll have a problem with anesthesia. But in the mandible, because you're giving a block, you can get away with it. There's one uh, question here. LA bottle contains 30 ml, but it's not, but it is also written not more than 10 withdrawals. Why? See, technically speaking, multi dose vials are not, it, 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 it is ideally you shouldn't be using them. Cartridges are better because the chances of, uh, as I said, you know the effectiveness of the local anesthesia going down and uh, um, uh, using it multiple times, you can get uh, pass infection into the multi-drug multi vial, multi-dose vial. So uh, ideally it's not to be used, but I, I don't know, uh, is it 30 ml? I, I really, <laughs> I, I'm not sure because I've never checked that thing out. Uh, how many ml does it contain? The entire bottle, the entire bottle, the entire bottle may contain 30 ml, sir. Then there, uh, the entire bottle may contain 30 ml, sir. The entire the bottle which is coming, it is 30 ml, sir. I'm not sure about that. I'm sorry. I don't know how many ml that, uh, uh, but I know it's about multi drug vial. I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly how many ml it contains. And I do not know why they say you can either say it to be used only once or not to be used, but why only 10? I do not know. I have no idea why they've, I've never seen it really, honestly speaking. Is that written on the bottle, they say? Not more than 10 withdrawals? I don't know. Not to the best of my knowledge. Um, sir, I'm getting a lot of uh, irrelevant questions also, but um, I don't want to waste your time on that, sir. No, there's lot no of... such thing as an irrelevant question, but uh, well. No, I... not, not pertaining to this, like, uh, how do you extract a, a distal angularity? Okay, that's, I, I suppose, you, you, I mean, these are things that you have to learn by actually you know, the hands-on experience. I know, we have hardly five minutes. I'm trying to... I have two more questions. You. Having said this, Bino, having said this, I just wanted to tell you something. I have a friend called John Mason in, uh, Mason in uh, Chennai. He does a 3D, uh, he creates 3D models 
for various pathologies and things like that. So he was telling me that he can actually create a 3D model with an impacted tooth inside and uh, with different materials for the tooth and the other thing. You can actually practice doing extractions and practice doing impactions on that. So I think if something like that comes, that would be the best way to learn how to do these uh, uh, procedures. I mean, explaining it verbally is very, very difficult to I can you understand, I can understand sir. That's why I was trying to avoid some questions because no, 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 it's no problem. No problem. So, know this, so many sir. questions. How many days do you have to uh, place the eugenol pack? I'm trying to select questions yeah. which are more yeah, relevant uh, to the you, day. You, you, yeah, uh, I usually leave it, uh, change it on alternate days. So if I place the eugenol pack on Monday, Wednesday, I would change it. And uh, if it needs to be changed, uh, sometimes uh, granulation tissue forms and you can... Uh, one pack alone is enough. Sometimes you have to change it three, four, five times. So uh, it depends on the case, on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, usually two, three uh, changes of uh, eugenol pack would uh, solve the problem. One yes, I have a question, sir. I have a question, sir. How to manage pain on injection sites after two to three days? See, injection site pains are usually because you have given the injection in the wrong place. If you inject, for example, into the pterygomandibular refe, you will have pain and spasm. So the only thing to do is to keep them on, uh, give them analgesics, muscle relaxants, and get them to open their mouths a little wider. It will go away. Yes. Okay, sir. So what precautions uh, to be taken for hemophilia and extraction of an angelo's tooth? So two different things, isn't yes, it? Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so um, the hemophilia uh, uh, management is fairly complex because all hemophilia, one millibrands, all of them have, uh, it's basically a factor deficiency. So you need to top up the factor. So in every city or town, they usually have a hemophilia club where they are aware about this thing. And um, you, pro you will need a physician's help in doing that. You need to raise the level of factor eight. It depends, there are different grades of hemophilia. So if you have 10% uh, uh, factor eight, then you may have only a very mild bleeding. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, you're supposed to have 100% normal. If you, if you say 100% is normal, and you're only 10% of the required amount of uh, hemophilia factor, there will not be significant amount of bleeding. So only when it goes below five or, you know, you have no hemophilia fa factor eight at all is when you have bleeding. So you have to actually give them factor eight. Of course, there is life, life, cryo precipitate emergency. You can give them fresh frozen plasma and things like that, but they need long-term treatment. And if you know that the patient is a hemophiliac, you top up the factor eight to a level where it is safe to do the extraction and follow them up for the next few days as well and uh, see that the factor eight is... Uh, maintained at that level, yeah. Can okay. prednisolone help relieve swelling? Uh, it's not advised. It will, it can. There are certain people who actually inject uh, uh, methyl prednisolone into the area of impaction and they say they get good results. I don't do it because uh, you should be very careful using steroids, especially if there are diabetics and things like that because it's an immunosuppressant. Uh, it inhibits inflammation and inflammation is required for healing. So um, you can look at it both ways, but I do know some people in absolutely sterile extractions, like in an impaction, they do inject uh, uh, steroids locally and they say they get good results. I don't, so it's not absolutely forbidden, but you need to be very how careful. To, using it, you know? How to control pulp polyp bleeding? See, uh, that's why I'm telling you this is going uh, to different uh, level. Uh, I know, I know. Yeah, well, pulp <laughs> polyp bleeding, I think uh, you need to just extract the tooth uh, or whatever you need to do with it. But uh, that will stop the bleeding and uh, cure it to the place and it'll stop it. But if you just, if you don't want to do an extraction in COVID times, you just want to stop the bleeding, you can use a RF, a cautery, a laser, or even a burnisher that is heated. All of them will work fine. What is the most common legal issue in extraction? I'm just picking up some questions that has some relevance to today's topics. Uh, one of the one of the issues that I've come across, I mean, probably useful, going to be useful to people who are listening, is uh, when you have two teeth with the interproximal caries, and the patient says he's got pain in one tooth and he wants only one tooth removed, you make a choice of removing one tooth based on your X-ray or your clinical finding, and then they come back the next day and say, "Doctor, you pulled out the wrong tooth. The cavity is still there." You understand? 
It's interproximal. So both the teeth have cavities. So these things have to be explained very well. And of course, I have had situations of fracture of mandible. Two, three patients have uh, uh, sued uh, their doctors. Um, root left behind. And in fact, I appeared for somebody in court and said, there's nothing wrong with leaving a root behind. Uh, infections, post-operative infections in diabetics, uh, which may not be because of the extraction itself, but uh, especially maxillary teeth. I've recently had a person who had a um, maxillary sinusitis, uh, went on to have pan sinusitis and developed uh, orbital epic syndrome, lost the eye, uh, eyesight in one eye, and eventually patient died actually because it went transcranially. But that was not because of the extraction, it was because the patient had mucoromycosis as a result of uh, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, and he happened to have a tooth extracted. So there are all kinds of things. That... Jabi, we are almost done. Yeah. With this, we hardly have one minute more. Job. Yeah, what, just sir, sir, the, the, the last question to you, sir. A, a, the one question has come is, uh, if the patient has pain after uh, a, uh, LA, what should be done? After the LA and the patient has got a pain, uh, difficult in opening the mouth, would you advise? No, no, are you talking about immediately after giving the local or? No, no. I, I mean, the next day onwards, uh, just because... Yeah, I already case. explained that. Probably the local anesthesia was given in the wrong place. It must have yes, caused yes. some muscle spasm. Done, sir. Done, sir. Done, sir. Done, sir. And then, uh, exercise and things. So, uh, let, let, let me conclude uh, today's session. Thank you so much, sir. It was an enlightening session. It was such an informative session. Uh, I have no words to explain to you how you explained it and people are responding that it's like a a power nap. It's like a, it's like open their eyes. They, 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 they know what they are doing wrong and the right thing that they are doing it. Thank you so much, sir, for coming in this three hours. I mean, you always told me it's a little late, Joby, for my time. But you know, the, our 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 community. We are around four thousand people who is watching uh, through the uh, Zoom and the YouTube live, sir. So thank you so right. much. Thank you so thank much, you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Jobby and Bino. Uh, it was a great pleasure. And thank you very much, uh, all the people who participated. I hope you benefited from it. And um, you can always, uh, um, I haven't put my email ID there, but I'm sure you can go through your, it's not very difficult to find me. Actually. Yes, sir. So, so what, <laughs> what, what about your DCA webinar, sir? When is going to come, sir? Yeah, uh, so yeah I, I might as well mention that. Uh, I think that's going to be a fairly useful uh, webinar because I'm going to uh, talk on informed consent, um, both as a general informed consent as well as informed consent during this COVID period, because there's a lot of litigations that are coming out of uh, inadequate amount of information. It's on 20th of September. That's a Sunday at 4 p.m. The okay. more, uh, acceptable time, I guess, on a Sunday. Yes, sir. Uh, so those of you who are interested in informed consent, it's a uh, uh, it, it, I'm going to cover a fairly uh, good area of uh, informed consent so that people understand what it is, when to use it, when it's not necessary and things like that, and also specific to our COVID situation. So, so thank you so much. Uh, you dear so members, much. please listen to what Sir says is uh, COVID, the in, uh, informed consent. Actually, today we I told Sir that we can include that, but Sir said I am going to do a DCI. So let us listen to that on 20th September, Sunday at 4 p.m. And uh, sir, if you can share, I mean, the, sh the, the link will come to all the groups. If not, sir, is getting the link, please share to us, to our platform. Yeah, yeah, we will share to everyone. We are on 8,000 people in our platform, sir. More than 8,000 plus people right, are right. there in our platform. So we can share to them so they can listen to that. Thank you so much, sir. Convey my regard to ma'am also, yeah. to everyone also. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. It was a great and, pleasure. And I wish you well. Good night. And uh, there's this uh, famous, uh, I, on Netflix, just because you're going to sleep right now, uh, Netflix has a, has a program called uh, um, Good Night and Good Luck. It's about a CBS reporter uh, who always ended his uh, program with uh, Good Night and Good Luck. I'll do that. Good night and good luck. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good night to all. Happy Independence Day. Good night to all. Yeah. Thank you.